Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Adiana Government Group's Designing Level 3, Level 4 IMI for Soft Skills Training. Effectively translate intricate soft skill development into immersive e-learning design webinar. Just to provide everybody a little background about Audiana Government Group, we are a human capital training and consulting company dedicated to delivering custom learning solutions that improve mission performance. For the past 18 years, we have delivered impactful, engaging, and awarding solutions to more than 65 civilian, defense, and security agencies. So let's just discuss some housekeeping information before we begin the webinar. If you have questions, shoot us an instant message via the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll provide you an answer during the Q&A session. If you are having technical difficulties, call WebEx at 1-888-966-8686 and reference meeting number 264-688-857. This webinar is being recorded. An archive copy will be sent to you via email tomorrow to share with others you think might find this webinar helpful. Lastly, please mute your phones so we don't hear any background sounds. Thank you. So let's get started. Your presenters today are Justin Sowski and Mark Heimberger. Justin is our award-winning senior immersive learning designer. He has over 10 years of experience in instructional design with a well-earned reputation for designing engaging, creative, and technically sound courseware for highly complex immersive learning projects using the latest virtual reality technologies with over 20 government organizations. Mark is another one of our award-winning senior immersive learning designers. Mark has over 15 years of experience developing web-based training. He has designed serious games and virtual worlds-based training for civilian and defense government agencies. Mark holds a Master's of Science degree from Eastern Illinois University. Now I will turn the pre presentation over to Justin and Mark. Everybody, this is Mark Heimberger, one of your presenters this morning, and uh, nice to have you out there this morning. We, uh, we appreciate you joining us for this conversation. I'm going to start off by uh, talking a little bit about our topics and agenda. Invited WebEx lets us. <laughs> there we go. So here's our plan for this uh, for this webinar this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about collaborating with subject matter experts in, uh, in order to gather the details for our Level 3 and Level 4 interactive multimedia instruction. Um, I'll talk about that for about 10 minutes, turn it over to Justin, and uh, he'll be talking about designing a realistic performance environment, one of the keys to Level 3, Level 4 IMI. Um, after about 10 minutes of that, Justin's going to talk about evaluating learner performance and uh, performance assessment. That's a little bit longer stretch for about 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll go back and talk about how we compile all this in a storyboard that shares the vision with our SMEs and stakeholders to enable them to review it and provide positive inputs. Um, that's going to take about 10 minutes. After that, we're going to ask you some questions at the end to see what you learned and probably have a little Q&A session uh, to round out the hour. Uh, I want to start this off, though, by having you ask yourself a question, and of course that means you have to answer it yourself, too. And the question is, now that I've heard the agenda describing an instructor-led PowerPoint presentation, I am blank. And the first one is A, engaged and ready to learn. The next one, B, already tuned out. C, planning to answer emails for the next hour, and D, I'm going to think about my weekend plans until the noise stops. Uh, we're using this to, uh, to illustrate the point that when, when we ask our training audiences to take a page-turning, um, computer-based or web-based piece of training in order to learn a soft skill and then test them at the end, uh, essentially what we're really doing is saying you only have to engage in this for about half of your brain. Um, and what we really want to have is full engagement. So uh, we have a real question to ask you this time around, and that is how do you prefer to learn new job skills? Now, we're putting a poll question up 
Uh, and so you should see a pop-up window with the poll question, and we're going to give you about a minute to uh, to answer that. And good, I see people are uh, are chiming in with answers on this. Good deal. So this is somewhat reminiscent of watching the election returns last night too, I think. So a few seconds left for you to get uh, to get your votes in on this, but from the poll results we see at this end, um, these are consistent with what we know about adult learners and adult learning theory. Uh, most adults prefer a hands-on approach to learning new skills. So why wouldn't we apply this to the soft skills like customer service or uh, you know, taking interest in uh, in uh, diverse thought processes, uh, those sorts of things. This is a reason why we recommend that the level three, level four approach to soft skills training is really the way to go if you want this to be applied and effective. So just to be sure everybody knows what we're talking about when we say level three or level four IMI, uh, Justin's going to explain that in a bit more detail. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks again for joining us. This is Justin. Um, when we're talking about level three and level four interactive multimedia instruction, specifically for soft skills, um, these levels uh, and the nature of soft skills are, are going to set your training apart um, from, let's say, a level two or something that was using hard skills. Um, first off, uh, level three and level four for soft skills is going to be testing at the application level. Um, so you're going to be testing the learners for what they can actually do versus what they know, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. <clears throat> uh, these types of training designs also include co uh, complex thought processes um, and complex decisions. Uh, you know, you're asking your learners um, to choose a certain path or to make a decision based on cues that they're getting uh, from other people or instructional cues. Since soft skills training with human interaction, there's also an emotional component to this. So you need to consider things like facial expressions, voice inflections, uh, uh, gestures, things of that nature. And one point that I want to make, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the images and demonstrations that we're going to show you later on um, have to do with uh, courses that we created using 3D avatars and animation. However, I want to make it very clear that you can do level three for soft skills uh, without using avatars and without using animation. It is something that can be done with images and text or audio. Um, so just want to make it clear that it's not necessarily the package and how you're presenting things. Uh, it really is the design uh, that goes into it that makes it level three and that makes it effective. I'm going to turn it back over to Mark here, and he's going to talk about uh, our first topic. In order to get the level of detail that we uh, that we want to get from our um, uh, for a level three level four uh, uh, program, uh, that that's going to require us, us to work very closely with the subject matter experts that are assigned to our project. And in order to do this effectively, you know we've got some goals. Uh, we want to develop a collaborative working relationship. Um, we want to gather all of the data required for our training solution design and not assume that we're going to be able to get more later. Uh, and there's a list of those things that we want to make sure that we get in, in an initial meeting with a subject matter expert uh, when we get a chance to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we, we want to establish learning objectives, uh, find out what the performance requirements are for the skill we're trying to teach, uh, learn a lot about the performance environment, the workplace environment. Uh, identify essential content, uh, not a lot of fluff. We really want to know what the learner needs to know in order to be able to do what they need to do. Uh, we have references and resources. We want to be able to provide learners with the, uh, the opportunity to go in and teach themselves more 
And a very important aspect is constructive feedback uh, in, in any sort of application-based program. Uh, and I, uh, the, the other goal of this is to facilitate a successful development process. Now, that really includes kind of setting the stage and getting buy-in from your subject matter experts and uh, other stakeholders. Uh, so that you can, uh, I guess, grease the skids for approval of uh, instructional products later on through the project and, and throughout the project. Now, these processes are used for all levels of training, um, but they're really more important with level three, level four, because of all the additional information about the working environment and about the performance requirements that, that you're going to need to get. We start by preparing to meet with our subject matter experts. And this means you know, thoroughly reviewing and analyzing all the materials the client might provide in advance. Uh, we want to be familiar with the subject matter expert. You don't have to know what the, what the SME knows, but you need to be familiar so you can talk with them. Um, and also especially know their terminology, uh, the jargon they use. Um, you don't want to have to uh, spend a whole lot of time asking your subject matter expert to explain the acronyms they're using. Um, you want to be able to talk with them again. And now this is also going to help you be uh, preparing more focused questions that get the details you need at the level you need them when you do get the opportunity to talk with a state. So you're prepared and now you have to collect data. And we recommend this be in a very focused environment an analysis working group meeting. Now, these can dovetail onto the end of pickoff meetings, and uh, that saves a lot of travel expense and is very effective. If we have our druthers, I guess, we'd prefer to actually do this at our location where we can get our subject matter experts clear of any distractions of their workplace and help them to focus on the task at hand. We can do this in, uh, in a number of formats. Uh, like I said, we can dovetail this onto kickoff meetings, which are frequently held at the client's location. Uh, it's also possible to do this over the telephone or via web conferencing, much like we're doing here today. But face-to-face -face is usually the, the best way to go when you're trying to get this level of detail. You go into a working session um, with the assumption that that's your only chance to talk with your SME and collaborate. Uh, for the uh, for the information and the details you need. If you take that approach to it, you, you make sure that you get all your bases covered. Um, you, you will have further, you know, I mean, in most cases, you'll have further opportunities to have subject matter experts clarify questions for you and things like that. But by assuming that you don't have that opportunity, uh, it sort of forces you to prepare better and uh, ask all the questions you need to ask and get all the answers you need at that initial collaborative session uh, when it's most convenient for both of you. When we first meet our subject matter experts, um, and we've learned a lot about this through training in cross-cultural environments, um, you, you want to develop some rapport and establish a relationship with this person. Uh, you're not just going to go in and get down to business. Most of the time when you have a face-to-face -face meeting with a subject matter expert, um, you're going to have the opportunity to do some introductions and, you know, talk and get to know each other a little bit. But it's important that we be the outgoing and inquisitive personality in those situations. Uh, and we're the ones asking the kinds of questions that are getting to know you kinds of questions. Uh, get the SME talking about themselves. Most people will like to talk a little bit about themselves. They like to talk about the things that they do. And actually, by talking with the subject matter expert about his or her job, you can gain a lot of insight uh, that's going to help you with communication and interaction over the course of the project. So you do that in a, in a relaxed format and get the SME talking about themselves. This also gets them used to having you ask them questions. Um, do avoid sensitive topics. Uh, obviously, politics and religion, two topics that we kind of, kind of stay away from when you don't know somebody very well. But you know, any of the other, even if you're just talking about the weather, um, that's a good way to get things started. And be sure to share a little bit about yourself, too. Let the subject matter expert know up front that you are very protective of their time and understand their schedule and their workload. Uh, SMEs will appreciate that you recognize that they're busy, busy people. Uh, many times we hear from subject matter experts that they have real jobs 
that's their way of telling us that they're busy people. Um, I, I, I prefer actually not, not to have them have to tell me that. I want them to know up front that I understand that being a subject matter expert for our project is probably extra duty for them. Establish a consistent approach to communications. Um, you know, ask a subject matter expert what they prefer. Uh, are they the kind of person that would just as soon have you pick up the phone and call them as soon as you have a question and take care of it? Or would they rather you list your questions in an email and send them at specific times a day? You know, what's going to work best for them? Uh, and with uh, the whole idea being that you're going to make this a, an easy process for them because, again, they need to provide you with a lot of detail and you will have a lot of follow-up questions. And it's best if you're, uh, if you're doing it in, in kind of an organized manner. Up front with the subject matter expert, you want to establish roles, define roles and responsibilities. Um, you want the SME to take ownership of the content. And that may involve a direct question um, or, or discussion of exactly who is the owner of the content. You, I view myself as kind of a ghostwriter for the subject matter experts. Do, do some research into what they're talking about, but, but they're really the, the the source of our content, and, and they really need to take ownership of it. And that makes things easier on you uh, when you're trying to uh, design the whole course, because uh, these folks will, will take more responsibility and make sure you have better details and better content. Make sure the subject matter expert knows up front what you need him or her to do all the way through the process. That includes supporting you during the design process by answering questions, also includes providing inputs during the review cycles. And again, these things are going to be more complex and, and, and more involved because of the level that we're working at. Um, so you really need them to focus on uh, those products and, and provide you with good input and good, good answers to questions and good sources of the answers to your questions. You, you need to do everything you can to facilitate SME input. Um, and that means, you know, designing questions so that you get the level of detail that you need. Uh, Justin's going to have a really good example of this uh, during uh, the next presentation. And when you're talking with SMEs, it's important to um, actively listen to all of their answers, uh, document them well and ask good follow-up questions. If you're already focused on the next question, uh, you may miss what the subject matter expert is telling you. Um, and so listening to their answers uh, before you go on to the next one is a good way of making sure that you're going to get all the details that you need. It's also our job to keep the process on track. Uh, we only have a limited amount of time in, uh, in any sort of a working group format. And so it's up to us to manage the collaborative process, to uh, draft an agenda, and to, to keep that agenda on time, uh, and keep the meeting focused on objectives. I think sometimes it's OK, and uh, letting, letting uh, people run off on tangents a little bit is good for the brainstorming process. But uh, there w will be times when you have to relook back in and, and move on to the next step. And finally, using visuals as much as possible so that people can see the thought process as well as participate in it. And this might involve using whiteboards in a face-to-face -face meeting or whiteboards in a, in a web-based conference of some sort. Um, it also involves using mind mapping techniques or brainstorming techniques uh, and those sorts of things that help people kind of, kind of see what you're uh, organizing as, as you go. And sometimes that's very helpful in, uh, in bringing out the best in people's uh, kind of creative juices. So a little bit about how to uh, effectively collaborate with subject matter experts. And again, this is something we do at every level of training in some way, shape, or form. But in level three and level four, uh, it's essential that we get more details and more information, uh, you know, particularly about working environments and the types of uh, requirements that we have our lear uh, from our learners for uh, or the tasks we want them to perform. And that's what's up next. Justin's going to talk about that. Thanks, Mark. So I just wanted to take a few minutes here to talk about designing a realistic performance environment. Um, when we're talking about level three or level four training, and specifically when we're talking about soft skills training, 
um, you know, we're dealing with settings. Uh, we're dealing with characters and dialogues and stories and scenarios and outcomes. Um, and in order to make the exercises realistic, um, you need to visually depict uh, what those types of things look like. Um, I'm going to ask a question here. I'm going to put up another poll question. Uh, and the question is, have you ever attempted to create a realistic performance environment in an e-learning product? Um, so let me just get that up here for one second. Okay, so if you could take a minute, think about if you've ever uh, had the opportunity to design these types of things in order to put your, uh, your learners in a realistic scenario. Uh, just a few seconds left. It looks like we have some folks that haven't answered. Okay, so I'm showing 50% uh, say no, they have not, and 33% says yes, they have. Uh, so we have a mix, not quite 50-50, but it looks like folks uh, have some experience doing this and some folks don't. Uh, that's going to help me um, decide uh, what kind of detail I'm going to go into as I talk about some of these things. So when you're creating a performance environment, the goal is to virtually replicate the environment so the learner experiences at, the learner experience is as real life as it can be. Um, are they in the right building? Are they talking to the right people? Uh, do the people look how they're supposed to look? Are they saying or talking how they normally should talk? The next goal is you want to maintain the learner focus in your course on the learning, the decisions they're making, the outcomes, and how they need to adapt to the situations. Um, if your details in the performance environment are not accurate, your learner may lose focus on the learning and your course may lose some credibility in the eyes of the learner. Um, and I'm going to talk about specifically what that looks like. This image is a course that we did. Uh, cultural awareness and, and negotiation. Uh, here we have a U.S. service member on the right that is talking to uh, a Philippine Red Cross gentleman on the left. And so I'm going to use just this image, just this still image, to go through some questions that you need to consider. Uh, the first one, looking at our military personnel, uh, is he the appropriate age for his rank? Obviously, if you had an entry-level military person, uh, or you had a high-ranking officer, uh, those two folks would most likely, one of them would be younger and one of them would be older. That's an important thing to consider. So here we have this overarching category of character demographics. Now this includes age, gender, ethnicity, and physical characteristics. We just talked about age and why that may be important. Uh, gender, specifically in cultural training, an example is Women in, so, in some cultures have a more passive role than men, um, and they may not speak during the interaction, or they may not be present at all. Um, getting the ethnicity right um, is, of course, important for cultural training. Um, however, if you're not doing cultural training, it could also be important if you want to depict a diverse workforce or just depict a diverse group of characters. Uh, physical characteristics such as height, weight, even getting down to the detail of facial hair and types of glasses, uh, is important that you get those details right. Uh, for example, the gentleman on the right may be uh, depicting a village elder in a scenario. So you need to ask what he looks like. Is he going to have a beard? 
uh, is that walking stick or cane that he's using appropriate for the region or appropriate for his character? Um, so character demographics are, is an important consideration and it's something you're going to want to ask your sneeze a lot about uh, when you're analyzing the environment. The next thing, character attire. A Red Cross gentleman, the question is, is this the correct uniform? Uh, and later on, uh, in a few minutes, I'm just going to talk about uh, how to nail that down with your sneeze. But character attire is very important. Um, it should be appropriate for the character role uh, or job. Uh, for example, if you're doing a diversity scenario in an auto parts store, uh, and you have your store manager wearing a shirt and tie, when he really should be wearing a blue polo and khaki pants, the learners are going to pick up on that. Uh, and they may lose focus on the learning, uh, and they may have that perception that all of a sudden this training is not credible because uh, folks aren't paying attention to the details. Um, speaking of details and attention, some things that you want to pay special attention to in character attire, uh, uniform, particularly important. Um, not only uniforms, but uniform standards. Um, a good example is uh, if you're depicting somebody in the Army, should, they be, should she be wearing sunglasses indoors? Um, that's something that is specified in Army regulations. Uh, so you would need to clear that up uh, and make sure you get that detail accurate. The other thing is cultural and procedural customs. Uh, for example, if you have a service member going to meet with a group of elders, uh, in the Middle East and he's invited to sit down and share a meal, the correct thing to do in that culture is to remove your footwear. Um, so are we depicting what wrong looks like or, or uh, a bad example by him wearing his footwear, or if we're trying to show a correct cultural example, the, uh, the service member needs to take his or her boots off. The next one is physical setting. So in this scenario, would these two characters really be talking about what they're talking about in this room? Um, again, the physical setting needs to be appropriate for the story and scenario. Uh, if you're doing a, a training uh, that's going to be released to a chain of grocery stores, um, you need to make sure that the details of the grocery store that you're depicting are accurate. You need to pay special attention uh, to foliage and buildings when outdoors. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to have a palm tree in Illinois or Indiana if that's part of your storyline. Um, also, you want to pay special attention to decor and background items uh, when indoors. So just looking at this image here on the bottom, you know, even getting down to the nitty-gritty details of, you know, are those vegetables at the market um, specific to that location? Are they accurate? The sign in the background that's in a different language, is that language accurate? Um, for the region that you're trying to depict. These things may seem uh, a little bit nitty-gritty, but they're actually very, very important to keep your learners engaged. The next thing, character dialogue. Here we have our gentleman from the Philippines, uh, and he's asking uh, our service member, did you see the soccer match yesterday? Uh, would he say soccer or would he say football? Soccer is typically an American term, uh, so the dialogue and the lingo does make a difference. Um, character communication, it needs to be realistic to the characters. Uh, for example, uh, if you were doing, if you were having a conversation uh, with somebody from France, that person would most likely need a French accent if you're providing audio. We just talked about terminolo terminology and nomenclature in the soccer um, or football example. However, another example is if you have two military personnel talking together um, and the one military person asks the other military person, hey, do you want to get together tomorrow at 8 a.m.? You need to consider, would they really say, say 8 a.m. or would they say 0800? Uh, so the terminology and the nomenclature that's specific to your characters is extremely important. Um, if you're providing audio, you want to pay specific attention to the pronunciation of terms uh, and names, uh, specifically acronyms if, if it's a military situation. Um, or if you're using um, uh, certain words or phrases uh, that come from a, from a non-English language. Um, the other thing is nonverbal communication. Character communication is just not limited um, to dialogue. Uh, you need to pay attention to the nonverbals and the gestures. 
For example, if you're doing a training for Disney theme parks on customer service, and you depicted a, a Disney employee pointing to the teacup ride, and she's pointing with one finger, that is an inaccurate detail. Uh, Disney theme park employees do not point with one finger because it's considered rude in other cultures. In other cu cultures, and Disney is sensitive to that fact. So Disney employees point with two fingers or an open palm. Details like that to keep your learner engaged and make sure they're focusing on the learning and not getting caught up uh, in the visuals uh, or in the inaccuracies of the environment. Decisions are also very important. Uh, here we have, uh, again, our uh, Philippine Red Cross gentleman is asking, did you see the soccer match yesterday? Um, how do you respond? Uh, you're providing some options, and you're providing a spectrum of options, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But when you're considering decisions, um, you need to consider not only what your decisions for the learner are, but also what are the outcomes for positive and negative choices? Uh, again, in soft skills, we're dealing with human interaction. So how is the opposite going to react in terms of his or her gestures and body language? If they're angry, their voice needs to change. Um, if they're nervous or if they're unsure, they need to have pauses in their dialogue. And the list goes on and on. Um, so in as part of the decisions, another thing that's really important to keep in mind, and I mentioned it before, but you need to tie what the learners are expected to do, not what the learners are expected to know to your objectives. There's lots of other considerations that need to be made when you're considering the performance environment that falls under the categories that I just mentioned. I'm just going to start rapidly popping these up. Um, is this the right camo pattern for our military personnel? Is this the correct patch for the Red Cross gentleman? And the list goes on and on and on. And you can see this becomes overwhelming very quickly. So going back to communication with SNEES, um, we recommend that you create a performance environment analysis document and ask some of these critical questions. Um, an example, uh, or an error-based example, if you ask, what should the Red Cross character look like, you may get a response from your SME that says, standard Red Cross uniform. Now, that's not particularly helpful. Then again, it's not necessarily the SNEE's fault. He or she answered your question. It's the way that the question is framed. So let's take a look at another example. If you ask, what should the Red Cross character look like, please specify the following. And we have some of our categories there. Uh, and then also, you know, doing a little bit of legwork for your SNEE and making things easier. You know what? We've done some research. Uh, please let us know if the uniform in the picture is accurate, and please let us know if the patch on the shirt is accurate. So if you ask something that's more specific, the SME can see that you really need to get into the details, and you may get a response like this. Yes, ideally this character would be a Filipino male, approximately 40 years old, uh, uniform and badge you sent are accurate, we'd like them to have a smartphone attached to his belt. So again, the details of the performance environment, um, no matter how specific or nitty gritty they seem, are very important to keeping learners engaged um, and, and allowing your course to maintain credibility. In this next topic, I'm going to talk about evaluating learner performance. I'm going to show a little demo of a course that we did um, and also walk you through how the learner decisions, uh, gaming, uh, uh, gaming scoring options uh, were created. And I'm going to walk you through a sample flow chart and also a specific flow chart that was for a, close, a course that we've done. Um, but before I do that, I just want to ask another question. Um, has anybody out there ever struggled to map learner decisions and outcomes for an interactive scenario with branching capabilities? So has anybody ever taken a look at the objectives, the decisions, the outcomes, and wound up with a bowl of spaghetti and not really known what to do with it? Uh, let me pull up this poll question, uh, and I will give you one minute to answer.
Okay, it looks like um, most of our folks out there have some experience. Uh, or excuse me, uh, or have struggled with this, meaning that they have some experience doing this. Um, and it looks like uh, about 28% of the people don't. Um, so hopefully that if you have done this, uh, if you do have experience, you have struggled, uh, this will be helpful. Uh, and even if you haven't struggled, uh, hopefully uh, we'll have some best practices and some tips in here uh, uh, that, may, uh, that, that may help uh, you work through things a little bit more smoothly the next time you try this out. I'm just going to walk through uh, a very generic example um, of what one interaction and decision point may look like in an interactive scenario. Um, you can see here that things are color-coded, so scenes are in blue, decisions are in gray, um, and the responses are color-coded uh, by the amount of points that they get, so optimal or best choice is green, poor is red, and uh, if they're going to fail immediately, that, that is bright red. Um, the thing that's important to keep, it, keep in mind when you're creating uh, these flowcharts um, is that there are lots of different ways to do this. We typically use Microsoft Visio because uh, a lot of folks in our office uh, have it and are comfortable using it. However, there are other ways that you can map this out. Um, the goal to keep in mind here is that, you know, your po positive and negative choices and outcomes are not always going to be black and white. Um, again, we're dealing with soft skills, so your, your choices uh, and your outcomes are, are going to represent shades of gray. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second or two, but let's just walk through some of the flowchart um, components uh, to get started before we go into our sample. Uh, first off, we have scenes. Uh, these are the scenes of folks interacting. Uh, we storyboard these like a movie script, and I'm going to show you that in just a few minutes. Um, but basically, when you're creating these scenes, you need to include your character dialogue. Um, and if you're using animation or you're using developers to create background images, uh, you need to mention if there's any movements, background noises, uh, if things in the environment are changing, and things of that nature. After we play out a scene, we have a decision point. Uh, the decision point includes a question uh, that corresponds to the scene that, that the learner just witnessed. Um, when you're working your decision points, uh, you're obviously going to have one question. Um, however, you're going to have a continuum of response options. In this example, we have a poor decision, in which case the learner is docked 100 points. Uh, an acceptable decision which gets them to the next scene uh, but is not optimal. Uh, and then we have the best option, uh, which is plus 100 points. Um, so it's, it's important to keep in mind that you keep your choices on a continuum or a spectrum, um, and it doesn't have to be limited to these three examples. Uh, for example, you could have a decision point uh, that's going to be such a deal breaker that the learner automatic fail, automatically fails the scenario. Uh, you could have a poor decision uh, and possibly allow the learner to recover. Um, you could have a neutral decision where the learner scores no points and advances. Uh, that's just kind of an okay or so-so decision. Um, you can have an optimal decision. That's the, the best possible answer. And you can have everything in between. Um, the recommendation that I make when you're putting this together um, is that you map out your optimum path first. Um, so the perfect path or all the correct answers, all the optimal choices to get through the scenario. I wouldn't necessarily first off add point allocations to those. Um, however, after you map your correct path, you want to determine what the path fail threshold is. Uh, for example, if your path fail threshold is 80% um, and you have 1,000 points available, you need to know that when you work out your choices that the learner needs to score 800 points or 80% of the 1,000 uh, to successfully pass the scenario. When you get into um, soft skills, um, typically if you make a poor decision, it doesn't always end in scenario failure. You know, if you're doing a customer service interaction, and you upset a customer, the customer isn't always going to walk out of the store. 
um, in most cases, the conversation continues. Uh, so it's important to include these recovery scenes where the learner maybe has a chance to apologize um, or, or a chance to, to right a wrong uh, where they made a mistake. Again, I mentioned we have automatic fail options. In this case, it was done on the recovery decision because they've made two poor choices in a row. Um, and in this case, uh, we would then uh, take the learners immediately uh, to their feedback. So they would fail the scenario um, and either have to do it again or get remediation or wh whatever your design is for what happens when they fail. All right. Uh, I'm going to walk through uh, uh, an actual example and provide some context uh, with a demo that we've actually done. Um, so let's, let's look at the, uh, the first scene here. This is what we're calling our hello scene. Um, in this scene, uh, we have a couple of characters. Uh, we have Colonel Taylor, who is the U.S. service member, um, and we have Commissaire Ali, who is a local police chief in Algeria. Um, Colonel Taylor and uh, his partner, Staff Sergeant Gibson, are in charge of uh, coordinating with Commissaire Ali on providing force protection services for a VIP convoy that's going to be going through um, the uh, going through the uh, the police chiefs or commissaires um, district. So here you can say we here you can see we have our script. Colonel Taylor, it's good to see you again. I must know how did your son fare in a soccer match last week. So we include a little background information. These two characters are met before. They don't really have a good chance to know each other, um, but they do know. Um, but they have exchanged pleasantries. Uh, Ali knows that Colonel Taylor uh, is interested in soccer, that his son plays soccer. Um, so let's just, uh, let's go to our decision point, which is decision point one. Um, Ali has just asked you about your son's soccer match. How should you respond? So in this case, we're giving three options. Uh, in the storyboard, we present the, op the, the question the, or the on-screen text. The option, all three options, and for each option, the content or what the learner is going to choose to respond, the points for that option, where this, where this navigates to in terms of an additional scene, uh, and then the feedback that's going to appear at the end of the course when the learner uh, uh, gets their final feedback. So let's just take a look at how this, uh, at how this plays out uh, in one of the courses that we've done. It is good to see you again. I must know, how did your son fan his soccer match last week? So here we have our introductory scene, and we now have our decision point. He's just asked you about your son's soccer match. How should you respond? Uh, you're given three different choices. Um, the correct answer is, ah, yes, thank you for asking. My son's team won, and he talks about soccer a little bit to build rapport. And then we have two uh, poor decisions. Um, the first one is uh, Commissaire Ali. We've gotten off to a late start. Uh, we've been waiting for about a half an hour now. Um, I'd like to talk logistics. This is, this is a, a suboptimal choice. And then we have, we, we don't have much time. I think we should get right into logistics. Um, in these two choices, uh, the learner is choosing to respond by, by not being sensitive to the fact that the police chief or commissaire was late, um, and he doesn't make an attempt to build rapport with him um, to talk, uh, maybe talk about some personal issues before they dive into business. Uh, so the correct answer when we get to that, um, ah, yes, thank you. My son made the team final, uh, made the uh, state finals. Uh, my wife said that he scored the goal, and then he's replying, "How is your family doing?" So he's attempting to build rapport. Um, and the feedback that you would get uh, at the end of the scenario is that yes, you recognize that he's placing an emphasis on establishing a relationship before talking business. 
We then have our two, uh, our two incorrect options, uh, which branch to a recovery decision. Uh, these are laid out uh, exactly as you saw the correct path where we have the content that the learner is going to choose uh, and then the feedback that would appear uh, in, the, uh, in the final feedback to the learner. Um, we actually have a recovery decision point here where if you choose we got off to a late start or let's talk logistics, um, Commissar Ali uh, is then going to suggest that you reschedule the meeting. Um, and now you need to respond with one of three choices. Uh, the correct choice, of course, is to apologize. And if you apologize, you then get branched to scene 3.0. And if you do this, if you, if, you, if you think this through, your branching doesn't have to work out like a bowl of spaghetti. Um, you can have your optimum path branched to the same scene uh, as your recovery path uh, just with some creative dialogue writing. And here you see in our third scene that both the, the correct and incorrect response map to the dialogue is just, is this Staff Sergeant Gibson? So now uh, the local police chief wants to introduce himself uh, to the other gentleman in the room. I went over a little bit on time. Uh, I apologize about that. I'm going to turn it over to Mark uh, for our last topic. Thanks, Justin. All right, so now you've got all of this information, and you, uh, you saw Justin gave a pretty good example of what's, uh, what our storyboards generally look like. And all this information uh, you've gathered from subject matter experts, um, you've designed a realistic working environment, you've mapped out decision trees for the assessment of learner performance, and any number of other things that you're going to put in there. And we have to now submit all that information in a storyboard for our stakeholders and our subject matter experts to review and provide us with good input that's going to make our products better. So, you know, how do we do that in a manner that, again, takes care of our subject matter experts, takes care of our reviewers, and makes it possible for them to do what we need them to do uh, in an efficient manner? Uh, we have to lay out the storyboard that way. Uh, so. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to just scroll through uh, the way a storyboard is laid out for uh, what you were just looking at, the course you were just looking at. And it starts off with a, um, with a, a, a how to use this document section. So in the how to use this document section, I'm telling, the, I'm telling our reviewers exactly what they need to do, what we need them to do. And I'm also providing them with some instructions for how to best accomplish that. Um, and here we have, you know, we're going to lay out what sections are going to be in the storyboard. We're going to provide you with scenario details. We're going to provide you with flow charts and a little explanation about storyboard tables. And now I'm also including some examples of storyboard tables and what sort of content that our reviewers will find in those tables. The storyboard tables tend to be both blueprints for development and the opportunities for reviewers to look at content. And it's not good if the reviewers uh, get hung up on the notes you're writing to developers uh, and start reviewing those. You'd rather have them focus on the actual content, the conversations, uh, the shot lists, uh, the things laid out in the working environment uh, so they can help us uh, make that even better. Oh, again, a couple of examples of the storyboard tables. These are pretty much like what you just saw Justin deliver. And also, um, we need our reviewers to provide us with feedback, and we'd like that to be in a consolidated format in one document. So we're telling them here and showing them um, how to provide us with feedback. Use the, the, the review toolbar in Microsoft Word if we're using Word for the storyboard and use the comment or track changes function in this case. If it's something different, then you're going to include instructions on, on whatever that may be. Our next section is the scenario details, which uh, are really the results of the environment analysis that Justin laid out earlier. Uh, and this is where we begin to tell the story and to share the vision of, of how this program is going to go. 
uh, and what we expect our learners to do and how we expect to assess them and how they perform and provide them with constructive feedback. So we begin to tell the story. I mean, this is literally the, it was a dark and stormy night part. We, we give them an overview of the scenario and, and what we expect the, uh, the, the, the learner to be doing, the, the character we expect them to play. We make these very visual. You see, we provide character details, and we even uh, offer pictures of what we expect these characters to look like. And we talk about the environment. And again, if we can, we provide a lot of um, uh, a lot of images of the environment so that they really get a feel for it. And then, and then the layout of, of how this program is going to work. Uh, what do we click on? What do we interact with? Excuse me, what does the interface look like? How does the interface work? Where do I get my feedback from? And then what's the overall objective here is to, uh, you know, meet and greet, negotiate. That, uh, in the case of this particular program, was part of the objectives. And we've also laid out uh, how learners will be scored um, when they're accomplishing this. And, you know, we include um, an interface overview so they get the feel for that. And wherever possible, we want to make that visible. And start to lay out our storyboard. The, here are our scenario flowcharts. And one of the things that we found very helpful for our reviewers is to provide them with a separate document that includes the flowcharts so that they can print that out and have it sitting off to one side. And it helps them stay oriented uh, with what they need to do. And then finally, after our flowcharts, again, visually laying out the, um, the process and the decisions we expect our learners to follow. Then we get into um, the, ver the, the details of the storyboards, and those are generally laid out in a tabular format. Um, and we've already provided our reviewers with notes on what to look for. So they should know going into this um, what they need to be reading very carefully and, and how to provide us with the input we need them to provide us with uh, in order to make this program a success. It's a little bit about developing storyboards that share the vision. And uh, that pretty much wraps up our content presentation this morning. And so we, uh, uh, we thought we might uh, take a few questions from, from, uh, from you folks at this time. So to uh, ask us questions, uh, please do that in the chat panel. Um, open up the chat panel. Send us a question if you have one, and, uh, and we'll respond. So we'll watch for that. So we have one question coming in. Um, it is, how do you organize the storyboards so the SMEs can logically follow the various scenario paths? Well, we, we organize the storyboard uh, the, the same way we, that, that we've organized those flow charts. And ideally, um, flow charts for decision path one will be connected to and uh, uh, correlate to the uh, specific storyboard tables, the, the scripts and the shot lists for, for that specific decision path. And by separating them out by decision path, um, we don't make them look at all of the flow charts first and then all of the tables next. Uh, we, we, we keep the different decision paths together in one section. Uh, and. Uh, and that helps to stay oriented with, uh, um, with, with, with the shot lists and the, and the scripts that, that correlate to, to those, uh, those uh, decisions that are laid out in the flowcharts. And just another note, you can, you can also add storyboard page numbers to your, uh, your shapes in your flowchart. So I see a question from... Uh, Another question here, uh, what should you do when a SME does not adhere to the agreed on rules and responsibilities? Well, you know, that never happens. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, actually, you know, there are a couple of different ways to approach that. Uh, uh, and we have had situations where 
um, what someone tells you face-to-face -face isn't necessarily what they do later on. Uh, it's nice if you can work it out with the subject matter expert. You're talking about a personal interaction here. And so hopefully you can have a personal, professional interaction and work those things out. You know, maybe there's a better way for me to go, go about communicating with that subject matter expert. And if so, uh, I want to find that out. Uh, as a last resort, uh, that's why we have project and program managers, uh, because this may, this may be a question that needs to be elevated uh, to the next level up and, um, and have those folks decide for us how we're <laughs> going to continue. But, you know, I, I, I always think if you try hard enough and, um, and, and treat the other person as a personal and a professional, then you can work something out and get what you need. So I have another question that just came in. Um, what should you do if your SME is reassigned during the project? Well, that, that also never happens. Um, actually, it happens a lot uh, because uh, particularly with the folks we work with, a lot of them get reassigned uh, within six months periods of time, which is about how long it takes us uh, sometimes to, to do a project. So you have someone coming in who's probably just as knowledgeable, but might have a different perspective. So you have to, you know, you, you have to go back to uh, kind of where you started from and reintroduce yourself to the subject matter expert, help to introduce the subject matter expert to the process as it's, uh, as it's progressed so far. Um, provide, you know, bring them up to date about decisions that have already been made and uh, kind of try to shoehorn them in uh, where the other person left off, uh, and, and hopefully that other subject matter expert is around to help you with that transition over uh, to a new person. Uh, again, it's a, a matter of having to be patient with a new person and, uh, and and professional with a new person, and just kind of kind of help to bring them up to speed about uh, how the project has been going and and what progress you've already made. Um. Great answer. So we have another really good question coming in. Um, have you found a graceful way to deal with scope creep, uh, feature creep in your engagements? Yes, we have. Um, we typically, um, before we go into the storyboard, uh, we create either a, uh, a course design plan, uh, document, uh, a detailed content outline, um, and we also include some prototypes of uh, screenshots uh, or perhaps environments or characters. Um, so we have the uh, we have the SMEs signing off on things uh, before we're getting too far into design and too far into development. Um, now, of course, if your SME uh, backs out on their agreement. Um, after they've already signed off on something, uh, that's something that requires uh, a little bit more grace and probably some renegotiation. Um, but in order to prevent that from happening, uh, uh, frequent and early documentation uh, is very, very important. Okay, we can take one more question before we wrap up. Are there any more questions out there? One, one last one coming in. Um, how can I show a level three approach for a soft skill training without using a 3D avatar and animation environment? That's a great question. Um, and I did mention at the beginning of the presentation that that was possible. I'll expand on that a little bit. Um, you know, if, if, if you're dealing with characters and you're dealing with, uh, with with environments and dialogue, um, you can just use still images of your characters. Um, and you can either play audio or you could simply have text bubbles. Uh, the characters don't necessarily need to be animated, but you, need, you do need to show a before and after. Uh, for example, uh, if your learner makes a mistake in a customer service interaction uh, and upsets the customer, uh, you may show the customer uh, with an angry facial expression or their hands on their hips or their arms crossed. Um, so you do need to show and depict 
different emotions and different reactions with your images, but it can all be done with still images. Okay. Um, can you just fast forward on the slides to the next one really quickly? I wanted to let people know that that's the conclusion of this webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. If you'd like to talk more about this topic or want more information about Audiana Government Group's immersive learning solutions, please contact Anna Passel Powell at 703-564-7150 or shoot her an email at a uh, patsell pat, slash powell at audiana.com. Uh, thank you and have a nice day, everybody.